My name is Rochelle Tomlinson, and I have the pleasure of bringing the breakdown to you today. I've been away for a few weeks, and I'm so glad to be back here in fellowship with you all, but I am truly grateful that the messages are on YouTube, so I can feast on them while I was away. Pastor has been in this series called Walking in Kingdom Confidence. Let's jump right in. Teaching through Romans 8, verses 26 through 28, it reads, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And we know. That is the message. That was the message from last week. Walking in Kingdom Confidence, part five. And we know. But do you? Do you know? Because pastor states that if you did, that would bring you into kingdom confidence. So we have been hearing so much truth from this series, Walking in Kingdom Confidence, but why? The picture, again, there's a sign outside of heaven. It says, Wanted Bold Believers, and it comes with a job description. Pastor talked through the job description in part four of this series. I'm not going to teach through all of that, but he was teaching out of um, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And I will drop down to part uh, eight, to point number eight, which he says, to be a bold Romans 12, 1 and 2 believer, one must be living proof. Living proof that God's will will be done in your life. That's what it's like when you're living in the center of God's will, and it's a choice. I choose to align myself with God's will instead of my flesh or what the circumstances say or what the some sayers say or what my past says. I choose to align myself with God's will. That is a kingdom choice, and a kingdom choice, Pastor states, brings kingdom confidence. So, making this practical, the question is, how do we become living proof? How do we ensure that God's will is done in our lives? And pastor proposes that we must grow from what we do not know to what we know. Romans 8, verses 26 through 28, we could see that there are some things that we don't know. You could see highlighted in yellow, and there are some things that we do. From this, the Lord gave pastor four words, exposure, engagement, experience, and evidence for how we transition into kingdom confidence. First, exposure, which equals biblical hearing. Romans 10 through verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That sounds like biblical hearing to me, but backing up a little bit, we have to study through verses 14 through 17, and it reads, how shall we call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. From this, pastor is able to lay out a recipe for word exposure, and he soundly concludes that those who hear must obey what they have heard. Biblical hearing, in other words, requires one to have a faith response to the declared word. The second E, engagement, which is wholehearted investment. This is not easy believism. And for this, I'm just going to read what Pastor said. Confess beliefs that fail to manifest as a confirmed behavior are meaningless. Even the demons believe that there is one God and their trembling revealed their belief. The Christian life is not a spectator sport. We must be both exposed and fully 
engaged. Point number three, experience divine encounters. We just heard about one in pastor's testimony. And again, I'm just going to read what pastor said last week. The single greatest differentiating factor between wishful believers and those with kingdom confidence is their personal experience with God. Divine encounters turn believers into kingdom warriors, making them bold Christ disciples. If you do not have a resume filled with God encounters, all you have is human tradition and religious custom. Your God cannot be anything but conceptual and your faith cannot be anything but dead. But our God lives, moves, and speaks. Enough said. Pastor said a lot more in this message, including retelling the account of how he was miraculously healed after he was stung by a swarm of wasps. Go back on YouTube to listen to the full account. But for this breakdown, enough said. Our God lives, moves, and speaks. And experiencing him through divine encounters will transition us into kingdom confidence. Finally, evidence. Prayers answered and promises fulfilled. We read earlier out of Romans 8 verse 26 that we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. So what's the point? What is the purpose of prayer if we don't even know what we're supposed to be praying for? Pastor answered that question, and he states that God gave us prayer to reveal to us that he exists and that he answers prayers. As to the question of why God gave us so many great promises, great and precious promises, a study through 2 Peter verses 1 uh, chapter 1, sorry, verses 2 through 4, Pastor answers saying that God gave us his promises so that we would experience his divine nature. Whenever a believer experiences answered prayers or fulfilled promises, it solidifies the reality of God and the unseen world. Elevating it above their natural existence and experiences and uh, delivering them from the, their entanglement with this world. So there we have it, exposure, engagement, experience, and evidence. And Pastor concludes that without these four key elements, a believer may believe or have intellectual assent, but will never trans be transformed into the bold believer that they were redeemed to become. They will be limited to religion, falling short of God's intended glory. A final scripture out of 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, it reads that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Folks, this is why we have the Bible, why we've been given the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped, i.e. walking in kingdom confidence, for every good work. This transition into kingdom confidence is a cycle, going from exposure to engagement to experience, to evidence, to becoming equipped, to being more exposed, exposed and more engagement and more experiences and more evidence, to being more equipped until you are thoroughly equipped for every good work. Going from what we do not know to what we know. The message was titled, Walking in Kingdom Confidence, Part 5, and we know, and I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel, listen to the full message so that you can know. And with that, let's bring back Pastor John Thompson. Today, I welcome you back to Walking in Kingdom Confidence. If this series is blessing you, just come on and give the Lord a big amen in the house. Hallelujah. Amen. We've been saying for the last few weeks that there is a sign in heaven that God is looking for bold believers, wanted, bold believers. And we pointed out that the job description can be found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, this is to believers, 
by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we look at that verse, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, there are people in our lives who do not believe in the God that we say we do. No indictment, just a question. Are you the proof that you need to be? Can they look at your life and see evidence that the God you claim to have faith in is real? It would take a special kind of fool. You know, some, some people are foolish undercover. Like you get to know them and you're like, she's kind of foolish. But some people, you see them coming down the block with a big F on their T-shirt. <laughs> they want to beat the baby, boo 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 You can see a fool coming. It takes a special kind of fool for me to see proof that God exists and to still reject. That takes a special kind of fool. When I was an atheist, I wasn't that kind of fool. I grew up in the church. And I was looking at people, and I could not see any evidence that God is real. All I saw was people who chose to live by faith. You got your coping mechanism, I got mine. Mine just happens to come in a baggie that's about that big and clear, looks like oregano. I get me a pack of tops and go to spinning. So you go ahead and say your prayers and I'll go ahead and fire up a few of these blunts. And when you get happy, I'm going to be happy. When you start seeing angels, I'm seeing angels. I don't want none of this. You want me to be religious. But I'm sorry, I'm converted. So am I the proof? He says, you prove it. You show them that I'm real. You get in your car and go to Baltimore because you heard a voice in your sleep. The other day, I, was, I got up. This was one I missed. And I heard, put on a tie, put on a suit, suit and tie, shirt and tie. I was working on a project. So some days I'll wear jeans and a plaid shirt, and sneakers, and go in and do what we need to do. And I heard, put on a shirt and tie. I wasn't sure, though, that it was the Lord. It wasn't strong. It was just like a thought. And it was running late, trying to get in near the school, found out later, reminded later that she had to go to the orthodontist and didn't even have to go to school. But nonetheless, I had already gotten dressed. I'm heading up the road, and as I was going up the road, my phone rang, my work phone rang. John, sir? Where are you? On my way to my office. How far are you from Fort Meade? I can make a turn and I can be there in no time. Come to my office. I need to meet with you. Now I'm in my jeans and my sneakers and my plaid shirt. I got there and all of a sudden I was being told that I was going to work two days a week now out of Fort Meade, and I'm being walked around the building, meeting all the executives, shaking hands. This is John. He's going to come on board and help us get all our systems in place. And I'm standing like, <laughs> 
they're like, no, you can take him seriously. There is therefore no now, now no condemnation. So I'm not kicking myself going to the car. He's just teaching me. And what he says is that it's not a big deal. Your work speaks for you, which is why you were called in in the first place. But I'm just telling you that nothing happens in your life that doesn't come across my desk. Oh, I wish I had somebody up <laughs> Where are you, Brother David? Come on. Oh, somebody. I need you to know that there's no accidents. Just because it's news to you doesn't mean it's news to me. So while you're frustrated because your plan didn't work out the way you thought it should, I invite you to the realization that you're not in charge. The steps of a good man are ordered by that man. I don't think so. Steps of a good man are ordered by his iPhone. He got the iPhone, iPhone 29. I got the iPhone 29. Talk about Alexa. Oh, this thing speaks to me, cooks breakfast for me, makes coffee. Clean the bathroom. That's my phone in there, cleaning the toilet. Look at it go. The 29. I got 17 cameras. <laughs> steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Can the Lord order your steps? Is it okay? Or do you have to know? Do you have to know? I'm just checking because you might have to know. Do you have to know? I'm not, I'm not being smart. I'm not, Teddy, I'm not. I'm really. I'm just trying to ask because some people are like, I got to know. If you got to know, I give you full respect. That's a special kind. <laughs> That's a special kind of foolishness. But, I, I, you know, I reserve the right for you to have it. As for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. Him saying, I missed the tie, but he didn't. It'd be different if I got there and had heard nothing. But he told me, I'd go with the red one. For me, it wasn't strong enough. I've been hearing from the Lord a long time. Had it been just a little stronger, I had on not only a tie, but a suit. I'd have gone in there with a cummerbund. I'd have been in there with a blue something looking like I was at the prom, 1970s, over, over at the punch bowl. Nobody drink, nobody dancing with me. I'm a wallflower. Dance with myself. Pray for me, Vicky. Just pray for me. Just pray. That's all I need. Just pray. So we went through and we looked at what a bold believer is, and we know these eight things come down to the end. They are living proof. Most important thing to be is living proof. And so if we're going to apply, we must be bold believers. Do me a favor and preach to somebody and tell them, be bold. If you're going to be anything, be bold. And so I sat with that as I was in my study. I sat with that revelation. And then the Lord reminded me that that's what he told us to be. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, he told us, let us therefore come how? Timidly. Come how? Unassuredly. Come how? Uh, frighteningly. Come how? Bo Somebody say boldly. We're supposed to break up in there like we own the joint. He said, come before the throne of grace boldly. Bam! Bam! My father is on the throne. How would you come in if your daddy is on the throne? Everybody else looking at you, sashing in like who she thinks she is. I'm the daughter of the king. <laughs> this is how a princess comes into the throne room. 
when I get to the throne, I bow and I kiss his ring. But when it's over, I say, what up, pops? <laughs> Thank you for loving me like you do. Let us therefore come, what? Boldly to the throne of grace. Implying that if you come any other way, you will not obtain the mercy or find the grace that you're looking for that will help you in the time of need. That means before you pray, you have to already be assured that your heavenly Father already knows what you need and that your prayer is not informing, your prayer is confirming and your prayer is merely opening a portal through which God can pour out his grace and mercy. I wish somebody knew what I was preaching about today. And so that brings us to our message. We haven't even gotten to a message yet. That brings us to our message. Walking in Kingdom Confidence, part six, growing boldly into boldness. Did I say bold enough? Boldly, growing boldly into boldness with your bold self. I want to give you three honest self-assessment questions that we're going to focus on today as we look at growing boldly into boldness. Number one, Am I living with a conceptual God? Don't dismiss it. It's a big one. Number two, am I living with a low heart? Because it's possible. Number three, am I growing boldly into boldness? Let's get into this. Question number one, am I living with a conceptual God? As I said last week, and I'll say again this week, the single greatest differentiating factor between the wishful believer and those who have kingdom confidence is their personal experience with God. Divine encounters like the one I described in our testimony I gave earlier, and so many. My wife and I have a book of remembrance. One of the things that we're doing in this season is updating it because it's one after another after another of God things. We have come to call it the God factor. And so many Christians are living without the God factor. Listen, they have the faith factor, but they don't have the God factor. Listen carefully. God didn't call you to share your faith. He called you to share your God. The Hindus got faith. The Muslims got faith. Our Christians got faith. Baha'i faith. They got faith. It's in their name. The Buddhist has faith. You can't buy Chinese takeout without that little man being over in the corner. Am I wrong? Am I making it up? I go in there, can I get a General Tso's chicken? <laughs> he up in the corner. Look like he done ate several egg rolls. Everybody got faith. Some people have, the atheist has faith in themselves. In fact, they have to have more faith because they're attempting to live this life without God. People need to hear your faith. People need to meet your God. I am God's POC. People can get to God by getting to me. Don't make it about your faith. Well, I just believe all dogs go to heaven. Keep your mouth closed. Come off that witnessing team. 
I'm just, I'm just saying there's a place in heaven for cats. You know cats don't come from heaven. Look at a cat. You ever look at a cat in the eyes? Cat look like the devil. When you look at a cat, it look back at you. It's looking like the devil looking back. Little eyes look like snake eyes in a fairy animal. A cat don't look like a, there's nothing from heaven. There's nothing in heaven walking around looking like a cat. I know. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Don't send me no letters. Don't send me no letters. Just my personal view. Divine encounters turn believers into kingdom warriors and make them bold Christ disciples. So am I living with a conceptual God? This is one of, the, one of a few problems that are truly plaguing the church today. People in the church who have faith but do not have God. And they hold on to what they believe, but they have no evidence that what they believe is true. Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. So, he's not telling us not to have faith, but the point of your faith is supposed to bring you to your God. He says, for those who come to God, see how faith immediately jumps from faith to God? But he doesn't say for those who have faith, but those who come to God, because your faith is supposed to bring you to God. He says, those who come to God must, one, believe that he is, and two, that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. If you look for him, you will find him if you look for him with your whole heart. If you say, I believe, but I've never had any experience with God, well, one of y'all is a liar. One of y'all is being untruthful, at the very least. I don't say God is lying. I'm just saying somebody ain't telling a fib. Because he said, if you seek for me, you will find me. If you seek for me with all your heart. He said, I'm not in plain sight. But I'm here. And you're going to have to work to see me. And if you work to see me, you'll find me. But if all you got faith is faith, you're going to walk away having never been touched by the Almighty. If all you got is faith, you should have God. If you do not have a resume filled with God encounters, all you have is human tradition and religious custom. Your God cannot be anything but conceptual, and your faith cannot be anything but dead. How can you have a living faith with a dead God? What do you have faith in? I just think everything's possible. Everything always works out. Time heals all things. You start hearing people preach like that, they preach, they got faith in themselves. They got faith in time. How many of y'all been hurt, deeply hurt, and time did not heal it? Let me see. <laughs> I'm talking about you've been betrayed and it's been decades. And when you see Roger, you still have to keep yourself from going for your stuff. You look at the trunk and you're like, I got a, I got a, I got a something, I got a, a tire iron, I got something. Cause there he go with his old, look at him. He all happy. And he with Rebecca. Oh, I, see, it's nothing but the Holy Ghost. Nothing but the Holy Ghost will keep you from going to get your stuff. Time did not heal all things. It feels just like you walked in and there, there she was sitting in your chair. And there she is now. 20 years older, still make me sick. Let me get my stuff. Let me get my... Y'all know what I'm talking about. What turned a group of uneducated, societal outcasts into a band of fearless warriors and ambassadors for Christ? They had divine encounters that confirmed that God exists and that he responds to those who seek him wholeheartedly. Their encounters with God confirmed that God is and that his word is true and that Yeshua is God's Messiah. 
Such God-inspired knowledge would cause any reasonable person. Like I said, you got to be a special kind of foolishness. To believe, to, to, to come to the place where you say God exists, the Bible is his word, and Jesus is the Christ, and you still going to resist him? You're not going to Nineveh? You're not going to go? I'm not going. Can't you see Jonah now? I don't care what he say. A couple weeks later, he sit up at Nineveh trying to get a bagel. You know he's trying to get a bagel. Such God-inspired knowledge would cause any reasonable person to live differently. So what do you believe? Three life-altering questions that we each must answer. I want to encourage you, if you know, you know, this is the time to really grab this slide. Think about this. Answer this question. These questions. Does God exist? I see somebody taking a picture. It's a good one to take a picture of. Does God exist? Or is God just religious myth? Really? Is there anybody out there? People struggling over UFOs. The biggest unidentified flying object <laughs> in the world is the one we worship. So at the point that you're talking about, I don't know if there's UFOs, I don't know if there's life elsewhere, do you understand what you purport to believe as a Christian? You suggest that there's another realm that is teeming with activity. Angels going by, doing running drills, left, right, left, getting ready for the final battle. And we worry about what Russia is doing. What must he do to prepare Jerusalem for his feet to hit the mountain? What must happen just before the earth quakes and the news services report a 10.9 on the Richter scale? We don't know what that was, but the epicenter was Jerusalem. Is the Bible God's word and therefore true? Is it? And is Yeshua the Messiah and therefore the only path to God? If these questions, if you answer yes to all three, they create a life-altering reality where the three of these come into a funnel. You got a real God, you got a true word, you got a Christ Yeshua. That would change your life choices. You have to be a special kind to be convinced of those things and for it not to show up in the way you live your life. Something ain't right. You believe the word of God is true and he said very clearly he made them be male and female and here I am putting on my dress and my wig to head to the club. Because y'all looking at me like, I just got to keep going. I got to keep going. And saying love is love. I can't believe these things are true. I can't believe these things are true and support that my, uh, that the girl from accounting is going to be my girlfriend when I'm married to Andrea. I can't support it. I can do it, but I got to know it's sin when I do it. You do know, I'm, I used to play baseball, I tell you all that. You do know that the pitcher doesn't have to throw strikes. Part of the game is to throw a ball, something that's outside of the strike zone, and to get the batter to swing at it as though it is a strike. 
But what he cannot do is throw a ball and then throw a fit and say it's a strike. When the umpire saw it was in the dirt, the machine in the back went boop. The catcher's way over here catching it. The batter's like, what? People in the stands are like, oh. And he said, that was a strike. It was, it was, it was. You can do it. Just call it a ball when you do. As you're sitting there saying, let me get a double. Call it a ball when you do. As you pick up that left-handed cigarette. That's for your pain. Your inner, your inner pain. Not your back. <laughs> okay. Your broken heart. <laughs> My heart's so broken. It's broken. <laughs> you can do it. Just call it a ball. Come on, somebody. Because you're a fallen being. And maybe in that area you have not been delivered yet. There's no judgment. We're all in process. And so you haven't been delivered from that yet. I don't have any judgment for you, but you cannot drink it. You cannot be high. You cannot be getting up out her bed and call it righteous. You got to call it your fallen nature that hasn't yet been delivered. You say, Pastor, I'm not there yet. I run into you over at the Rio and you're like, ah, oh, this Charmaine. But aren't you married to Roxanne? Yeah, I'm working through some stuff, Pastor. Yes, you are, brother. I'll see you at church on Sunday. And you come on in and fellowship because the Lord got to work on your heart. How do you worship him out of clean hands and a pure heart? He does that. We don't need to be throwing rocks at people because I find you in your sin. You just haven't found me in mine. But don't call it righteous. You still got a limp. And you're trying to play it off and make it a bop. It's not about, and you're not Obama. <laughs> you say, okay, 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 you got me. I am living with a conceptual God. You got me. I'm living with a conceptual faith. Bring, how, what do I do? Bring me out of this. I'm going to show you how to come out of this, how to come out of a conceptual faith. <sighs> there are levels where we come to, and we call it faith. Sometimes people say they have faith because they've heard something before. Personally, I get tired of people talking about what they've heard before. I do. Just pray for me. I, you know, yeah, I heard, I heard that one before, Pastor. I'm like, yeah, you still ain't living it. <laughs> if I said it 32 times, so what? You're still not living it yet. So your hearing it is my proficiency in the word. <laughs> I'm adept at putting the message together. The question is, has it been written on your heart yet? Let me see when you prove it. But beyond hearing it, we start thinking it. That's where people leave here. They leave on Sunday and say, Pastor, that was a good one. You really gave me some things to think about. See, so you hear what they said? They said, I haven't accepted it. I'm going to run it through my mind. I was good, Pastor. You gave me some things to think about. You come to dinner, and I put the meal before you, and you say, ooh, whoo, mm, looks good, smells good, everybody else eating, but I'm going to think. <laughs> you gave me a meal to think about. Ooh, let me think about it. Oh, sirloin, uh, uh, Seneca sirloin, meet him well. I'm thinking about you. Ooh, mashed potatoes and gravy. Eat that, baba, ah, sa, a gravy. Instead of eat. So you leave the meal with a doggy bag, with a box. 
When everybody else ate, you made it take out. So you could take it home. And what? Think about it. We say this stuff all the time and don't even think, oh, he really, pastor really gave me something to think about. What are you thinking? Why aren't you eating? Is God true? Is he real? Is the word of God true? Is Christ his Messiah? Is the pastor preaching from the word of God? Is what he's saying, therefore, anchored in truth? Is it not fact that knowing the truth makes you free? Why haven't you eaten yet? Just wondering. Just thinking about. Are you trying to do this thing on your terms? Your life will be better when you give it to Christ. Then we go beyond thinking to believing. Sounds good, believing. But believing is still opinionated. It still has to do with your perspective. It's not a statement of reality. What, what, time will you be, what time will you be there? They say, I believe I'll be there by 3.30. What are they telling you? <laughs> what are they telling you? They might not even show. Because they, te- they didn't tell you they were going to be there. They say, I believe. You going to eat tonight? I believe I will. I'm, going to st- I'm stopping on the way in. Because you believe in, and I'm trying to get me something to eat. Do you love me? I believe I do. You don't call home and tell anybody about that. I'm seeing a guy. <laughs> you still seeing the same guy? Yeah, I see him. Because he believed he want to marry me. Let him ask me something like that. I believe I want to spend the rest of my life. You might as well get up. I am not impressed. I believe I'll buy you a ring. And often we stop believing. Stop it believing. Somebody do me a favor and preach to somebody next to you. Tell them, go beyond belief. Tell them, go beyond belief. You got, your belief is your faith. Your belief is your faith. And people sitting around talking about what they believe. I just believe God don't put on us more than we could bear. It doesn't say that in scripture. You get wore out. Believing. I don't believe God put on anything more than I can bear. It's not what he said. He said, with the temptation, he gives you a way of escape. He never told you he, would put, he wouldn't put more on you than you could bear. There's no reason to have a God if everything comes in your life. You can bear it. You don't need God. You just need him to look over and make everything okay for you. The point of having God is that you are going to have things that you cannot bear. And he says, I am a burden bearer. And so we have to go beyond belief to knowing. And that's why I said last week, and we know. Do you know? You can only be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt by God's hand moving in your life. Your faith will never take you beyond belief. You must experience God. So back to our three honest self-assessment questions. Am I living with a conceptual God? Question number two, am I living with a low heart? I've been talking to you about transformation, how to be transformed. And some of us just have not been transformed. I was, you know, I have these meetings, so I'm in a meeting and someone asked the question, 
could be conquered couples, it could be four, five, seven. Somebody asked a question. But what about if you are just an anxious person? You're worried, you're fearful, and you're trying to walk this thing out, but all you've got is your doubts and your fears and your limiting beliefs. How do you do it then? My answer to them is you can't. You can walk with God, but you must follow his path. You can. I'm trying to go to school, but I don't want to go to school. How can I go to school? If you're not going to be homeschooled, you got to go to school. Well, I can get the GED. You can get the GED, but that's not the same as going to school. GED, you'll never play on the basketball team. You'll never march in a band. You will never actually go to school. So, well done. You can move on in your life, but you cannot go unless you go. And so, you can walk with God, but you've got to go God's path. That means you've got to do your part, and then God will do his part. Somebody say to me, I've got to do my part first. Someone talk to me. Tell them, I say, I've got to do my part first. And now, now, make it a confession. Say, I'm doing my part. I'm going to do my part. I'm engaged in my part. Now, let's talk about it. Active mind renewal, AMR. My part in the transformation process is to renew my mind. Look at these scriptures, because perhaps you're just not convinced, but I want you to see them. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ephesians 4, 17 says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk in the walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, knowing their un, having their understanding darkened, ha, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. They are walking in darkness because they have not renewed their mind. Ephesians 4.22, jump down. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Sometimes when we hear put off the old man, we're thinking it's talking about old ways of acting. He's not talking about behavior modification. He's saying put off your old way of thinking. If your thinking and your believing and your heart is converted, then the things you do no longer fit. I don't need you cleaning your hands. I'm trying to fix your heart. And he goes on to say, when you do your part, God will do his part. God's part, step number two. Divine heart conversion. Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you the heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you will you will dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God. All the way back to the Old Testament, he said, the plan is you renew your mind and I will convert your heart. You cannot walk this out unless you get a new mind and a new heart. You cannot put new wine in an old wine skin. It's going to burst and run all over the place because your old mind is not prepared for the new truth. And this is a new wine ministry. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He said, I'm dealing with your heart. 
So here's how it works. My engagement is to renew my mind. God's response is to convert my heart and restore my soul. Time does not heal all wounds, but I know one who restores our souls. Honest self-assessment. Where is my heart? Do I have a fallen, darkened heart? Like, do I have the heart I was born with? Am I still living as the person that I always was? People start talking about how they were when they were growing up. You know, when I was a child, I was, I almost, glo- I mean, my eyes glaze over. I'm like, unless you get ready to do a before and after story, what you're sharing is probably not relevant. Perhaps, but probably not. The core of who you are is consistent whole, your whole life. But if you're talking about, I've always done good. Since I was a child, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. no glory in that. I need to hear your Christ story. Do you have a low heart? That is, you're saved and you're born again, but you haven't haven't cooperated fully with God's process of renewing your mind, so you live with a low heart. Let me give you a good example of a low heart. A low heart would say, one thing's true about kingdom life is that, you know, Pastor John is always trying to make us change. That's how a low heart would process it. Here's how a high heart would process it. One thing that's true about kingdom life, Pastor John is always trying to make us grow. A high heart sees growth. A low heart just sees change. I'm not interested in you changing because you might end up worse than you are. I got eight arms now. (laughs) I'm not interested in you. That's a change, but the devil. I'm not interested in you changing. I'm interested in you growing. Growing requires change, but you can change and still not grow. So how am I living with a high heart? Let me show it to you here so you can see it. Three options for where your heart is. One, matters of the heart. I'm living with a, with a fallen heart. That's option one. How do I know? Am I still chasing the world? Am I still pursuing accolades? acceptance, applause, achievement, still trying to climb that ladder, acquisition, my value is in getting things, affirmation, needing to be recognized. I'm leaving the church because I served on that committee and nobody even recognized me. That's affirmation. (laughs) Do you, you know what I'm saying? You know, I sat in a church for years and never preached. I sat in a church for years and never preached. The one who preaches to you every Sunday sat in a church for years and never preached. Because I didn't need affirmation. I wasn't sitting there talking about, they don't know what kind of anointing I got on my life. They see me up here in this balcony. They hear me up here. What you working out, fallen heart? You can't walk with God and still be the me you've been. Option two. I'm living with a low heart. I got Christ in the picture, but he's helping me get things in the world. I'm still after the world, but Jesus is my co-pilot. Come on now. Do I see Christ as an additive to my life, or have I traded in my old life and embraced the new life awaiting for me? Galatians 2.20 I want to read this. This is uh, Galatians 2.20 expanded and amplified. He says, I, 
the old me have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, the old me, who live, but Christ lives in me, the new me, and the life which I, the new me, now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The issue is, am I living a God-enabled or am I living a God-initiated life? And often there are things that happen in our lives and we just give God courtesy credit. I was trying to get a job, and I'm telling you, the people who was applying for that job, they were more qualified than me, but then they called me, and they said, I got the job. And I said, only God, <laughs> only God, only God. Well, technically, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just her resume. Maybe the interviewer liked you. Maybe you felt unqualified, but you actually were. And you saying it's only God because he blew on what you were doing. But what you haven't had is a God-initiated experience where you know that you know that you know that it's truly only God because it's only God. And you become a passenger and not a God-blessed driver. I was driving down the road, all of a sudden this truck swerved, and I don't know what happened. And I just went over here, and I went there, and then I went there, and I said, whoa, go ahead, God. Maybe it was God. Maybe it was adrenaline. Because what most of us have are God-enabled experiences where we are doing something, and we give credit to God. We say, I never should have got that. I went on a lot. I said, I'd love to have that. The man said, I'll write it up. I'm only good. Because <laughs> I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't think I had the credit for it. I didn't think my down payment was enough. So I'm giving God credit. What happens when God wakes you up in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, they're stealing your money? You're asleep. They're stealing your money. And you go to your computer and you open it up and find that someone has debited your account with an unauthorized transaction. It wasn't like I was balancing my book and I don't know what made me say. And I looked over there. I said, ah, only God. Won't he do it? Won't he will? <laughs> and what most of us have are God-enabled experiences. Well, we give him credit. I'm looking at Brother James Fields over here. I was in the room when the doctor came in and said, it doesn't look good. Are you his minister? I said, well, I'm a minister. <laughs> so he let me, I wasn't his pastor, but they let me stay. And they said, James, you're not even supposed to be here, are you? According to the medical records, you were not supposed to make it out of that hospital. The numbers they were seeing were the numbers that they see just prior to, to, to pronouncing you dead at a particular time. Isn't that right? And what'd you say when I left the room? What'd you say? You said, I'll see you soon. He didn't, it wasn't like he said, I woke up the next morning. I got a bowl of Cheerios. I just happen to remember that the Cheerios make you well. So I put a little milk in and had a little strawberry. Can you say strawberry? Strawberry. And the Holy Ghost came down and moved in the milk. While he was asleep, the great physician walked in through his medical team. Bad boy that he is. Just say, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. He's got work to do. And took his holy finger and touched him once and walked out. It is finished. Oh, ho, 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 ho. glory to God. And that's why he's here. Because it left his medical team dumbfounded. We didn't change the protocol. 
We didn't change the medication. We don't know why you turned around. That's only God. But often we see Christ as an attitude. And we are looking for him to help us get our share of the world. Option three is we are, we are in the world but not of the world and our eyes are on Christ and as we seek him, he sends us back into the world to be his POCs. This is what Matthew 6 is talking about, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. This is what I was talking about last week. I may end here, but this is where I was talking about last week. I was talking about loving my wife in 38 years and making a decision and choosing to love her. And somebody said, I thought you loved your wife. You all seem to get along so well. I was like, they didn't even get it. So I want you to get it. I want to go on record. I had I absolutely adore my wife. Not only do I love her, I like her. If they said to me, you can go home early today, work, finish your day out from home, I am not. In fact, when they said, they get ready to say finish, they said, I was already booting down. Putting my stuff in my bag. You can. I was halfway to the car. But everybody goes into marriage. Unless it's like a shotgun wedding or some other, you know, arranged wedding, they go into marriage adoring the person. And yet, 50% of all marriages do not make it 10 years. So apparently, adoration is not enough. People who would hear that testimony and feel like something is missing are people who are broken and who are looking for the affirmation of someone else to tell them their worth. So they're in a relationship and they need to hear them tell them, to tell me you love me because your saying it establishes my value. And when my wife tells me she loves me and she does it often, just on our anniversary, we were riding around, she looked at me, and she said, John Thompson, you know I love you, don't you? And I had to process it. I had to come into the moment. I'm str struggling, Katie. I was like, yeah, I believe you do. <laughs> and then I said, I heard myself. I know the chain. And then I was like, I know you do. And I was like, you do. She looked at me like, you're going through a lot. And I had to explain, I'm not even thinking about what you're giving me. Like, I'm glad you love me, but I'm so busy loving you that it hadn't even dawned on me whether or not you love me. If you said you hated me, it don't matter to me. No, never mind, because I'm going to love you to the grave, girl. And if I leave here before you do, I hope to bless you so that you get loved even in my dying. I want them to bring you a check, and it says he loved you all over that check. <laughs> so I had to shift my mind to think, you talking about what I get? Yeah, I guess you do love me. But it's not my motivation because I'm not trying to be loved by her. I'm too sufficiently loved by him. And it frees me then to love her with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. I'm going to stop there. I got more, but I'll tie it into the next message. I hope that was good for everybody. Did I speak to you today? Praise our God. Let's stand on our feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope that that was a significant deposit. Was that for you? Somebody else, that was for you? Sabrina said that was for you? Praise God. But we thank the Lord. We thank him for his deposit. We thank him for his invitation. 
And we thank him for his call. If you receive the word, I want you to do me a favor. Open your hand, palms up. That's you taking it. That's you saying, no doggy bag for you. That's you saying, I'm eating right now what I heard. Father, thank you for giving us a meal worth consumption. Let it be integrated deep into who we are and transform every fiber of our beings. Mind, heart, soul. Have your way in us, through us, and around us so that you get the glory out of our lives. We thank you, Father, and we give you praise for all of this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a great week. I'll see you next week right here at Kingdom Life. Thank you for tuning in to another life-changing message from Kingdom Life Community. If today's message blessed you, please like, comment, and subscribe. But most importantly, share. Share this message with your family, friends, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs to hear this word. You never know how it will impact them. We pray that you have a blessed week and remember to live the kingdom life. We'll see you soon.